In the early 20th century, a different kind of gold rush began. Forget gold nuggets, this time it's all about a dense black liquid, oil. It marked the beginning of an era that's not just about unprecedented economic growth, but also a roller coaster of conflicts, shady alliances, daring coups, and high stakes negotiations. At the heart of it all, the Middle East. Hidden beneath its endless dunes lies the lifeblood of modern civilization, a treasure that sets the stage for a geopolitical drama that transformed the Middle East into a gigantic chessboard where global powers move their pawns, kings and queens turning the region into a strategic battlefield where every move can change the game. So join me on this nearly 100 year long Middle East oil saga of sudden wealth, crisis and relentless power struggles that continue to impact our world today. It's August 27, 1859. American businessman Edwin Drake strikes oil for the first time. Guess what he uses for storage? A whiskey barrel. Talk about improvisation. In doing so, he set a new standard. The whiskey barrel became the barrel, the official unit for measuring oil, holding about 159 liters. Before we continue, let's clear up a common misconception. The black stuff that is pumped from the ground, that's called crude oil. Once it's processed, it becomes the oil that we're more familiar with. For simplicity, we'll refer to both as oil in this video. When people realized it was much more efficient than coal and easily transported through pipelines, oil quickly became a very much wanted commodity. The industry boomed, with production soaring from 500,000 barrels in 1860 to 20 million barrels by 1870. By 1920, this figure had rocketed to 450 million barrels annually. In its infant years, the U.S. dominated the industry, producing 60 to 70 percent of the world's oil. And who was at the helm? Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, a monopoly until its 1911 breakup by the Supreme Court. Substantial oil reserves were subsequently found in Mexico, Iran, Venezuela, and Iraq. But then in 1938, jackpot! American businessmen discovered in Saudi Arabia what was then the largest known oil field. And it wasn't just a groundbreaking find, it was a game changer, marking a major shift in global oil dynamics. For more than 600 years, the Middle East was under the Ottoman Empire's rule. After a gradual decline and eventual defeat in World War I, its territories were divided. The British had their eyes on the prize and gained significant control over many oil-rich Middle Eastern parts. Despite Britain's limited oil resources back home, they suddenly found themselves sitting pretty as a heavyweight in the global oil game, controlling regions holding nearly 50% of the world's known oil reserves. But the world changed in 1938. The discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia. The Americans, not ones to miss a party, realized they couldn't just watch from the sidelines. Recognizing the strategic importance of Saudi Arabia's gold mine of oil, conveniently outside British clutches, they jumped in, claiming their share of this new vast oil bounty. This series of oil discoveries transformed what had been desert nations that relied on tourism into superstars of the world, leading the globe into a turbulent era that would last a century. Let's quickly explore the nature of oil. It's something people can't seem to live without. It's sort of like a necessity in the modern world. If it's cheap, everyone is eager to buy. If it's expensive, everyone will curse, but they'll still buy it. And demand is only going to increase. And here's the key point. Unlike crops that can be grown season after season, oil reserves are finite. Once depleted, there's no restocking. Now picture the immense power someone would wield if they managed to control this scarce resource by owning the extraction and distribution sectors. Well, this is a strategy famously employed by Rockefeller. He wasn't just a player in the game, he was its undisputed king, making him one of the richest people of his era. Post Rockefeller, the 1920s were like a Wild West showdown in the oil industry. Intense price wars were the new normal, leading to rock bottom oil prices. No one was making much money. But then the oil tycoons had their eureka moment. They said, why do we keep fighting each other? 
no one can win this battle, and even if someone does, the government would just swoop in and break us up again like they did with Rockefeller. How about we team up instead? So, in 1928, the leaders of the three major oil companies sneak off to Scotland. It's there they shake hands on the As Is Agreement, a nifty little pact to carve up the market, sidestep competition, and keep prices steady. Soon, four more companies join the club, and voila, the seven sisters are born. The seven sisters weren't just playing house, they were playing Monopoly. Together, they controlled almost all oil extraction rights in Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf countries, owning a staggering 85% of the world's oil reserves. And for more than 20 years, their secret deals stayed under the radar, away from other companies and even governments. <laughs> in the world of economics, this is called a cartel. Their mission? Control a resource, cut down the competition, and keep those profits flowing. In the oil market, where the resources is scarce as it is desired, the temptation to form cartels is as high as the sky itself. We'll get into that later. The Seven Sisters practically called the shots in the Middle East's oil sector. They did pay taxes and fees to the local governments, but their main goal was always to keep costs as low as possible. If a country dared to demand higher taxes, the Sisters had a tactic ready. They would threaten to shift their operations to a neighboring nation with more favorable terms. This strategy often worked, pressuring governments into reducing their demands. This left the Middle Eastern countries in a tough spot, as they had no other significant oil business partners besides the Seven Sisters. Now, you might be scratching your head wondering, why didn't Middle Eastern countries just take over the oil game themselves? Good question. Well, there are four pretty big obstacles. First up, many of these oil-rich countries weren't exactly holding the reins of power. Still under Western control, nationalizing oil was about as likely as snow in the desert. Second, even if they held the reins, they still had to play nice on the international market. Nationalizing oil production? They would have faced immediate sanctions from Western governments, restricting exports and crippling their economies. Third, there was the issue of cash and know-how. Sure, they were sitting on black gold, but what good is treasure if you can't dig it up and sell it? They lacked both the money and the machinery. And fourth, let's say they managed to pump up the oil. Selling it was another story. The Seven Sisters were like the bouncers at the club of the Western oil market. They decided who got in. And guess what? That club was their only major customer. It's of course more than obvious that the Seven Sisters had the full backing of Western governments. Take BP, for example, comfy under the wing of the British government, calling the shots in Iranian oil fields. Then, in the aftermath of World War II, a significant deal was struck between U.S. President Roosevelt and Saudi Arabia. The essence of it? American companies got front row seats to Saudi oil. In return, the U.S. rolls out the red carpet with weapons, military protection, and gold. This deal effectively made the U.S. a VIP in Saudi Arabia, exchanging oil for arms and financial benefits, a relationship that is still going strong, with Saudi Arabia remaining one of the U.S. top buyers of arms. In a way, the Middle Eastern countries were like the tenants, and the Seven Sisters the all-powerful landlords. They had the keys to every door. They decided where to drill, how much black gold to pump, and who got the privilege to buy it. It was their game, their rules. When Italy's state-owned oil company knocked on the door hoping to become the eighth sister and get a set of keys too, they were met with a firm no vacancy sign. In a stroke of ironic genius, the frustrated chairman of the company labeled them as the Seven Sisters, a nickname that highlighted their tight grip on the oil market. The Middle East has long faced exploitation, and while the governments might be okay with minimal oil profits to maintain peace, the general population ended up with nothing. That led to discontent in the region. It first started to emerge among the Iranian people, Controlled by Britain, Iran's oil was in the hands of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, a predecessor of BP and one of the Seven Sisters. When World War II began in 1939, oil demand soared. The United States and the Soviet Union saw Iran's abundant oil reserves and wanted to join in on the action. With everyone wanting a piece, a stalemate situation emerged. Iranian parliamentarian Mossadegh saw this as an opportunity and took advantage of this deadlock among the great powers. In 1950, he proposed the Iranian parliament an audit of the Anglo-Iranian oil company's royalties and accused them of intentionally reducing oil production. 
Taken by surprise, the company, along with Iran's pro-Western prime minister, resisted this move. But then, in a dramatic turn of events, the prime minister was assassinated on March 7, 1951. Just eight days later, Iran's parliament fast-tracked a vote to nationalize the oil industry. The motion passed, and by March 17th, Iran announced its oil nationalization, with Mossadegh becoming prime minister in April. This bold move led to severe consequences. Britain, in response, immediately sent warships to the Iranian ports, with the intention that no one would be able to sell a barrel of oil from there. Iran's oil output, which stood at 240 million barrels annually in 1950, drastically fell to just 10 million barrels by 1952, a direct result of these actions. It's not that their production capacity was insufficient, but rather that they couldn't sell the oil they produced. It would simply accumulate. More shocking, in the first year after nationalization, Iran only managed to sell 300 barrels of oil. Britain, having watched its cash cow being led away, was not amused. In a move straight out of a spy novel, they turned to their ally across the pond, the United States. In a dramatic turn of events in 1953, the CIA orchestrated a coup that toppled Prime Minister Mossadegh of Iran, a leader who had become inconvenient for oil interests. He spent his remaining years confined until his death in 1967. The US and Britain then installed a new leader, one who would hand back the keys to Iran's oil treasure chest. This strategic move wasn't just about oil, it was a power play. It significantly boosted US influence in two oil-rich heavyweights of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Iran. These countries were the chess pieces in a larger game of maintaining regional stability and playing defense against Soviet expansion. The rather unsuccessful experience of nationalization in Iran also frightened other countries in the Middle East. For quite a while, no one dared to bring it up again. The Americans actually preferred everyone to make money. They weren't fans of the British model of squeezing Iran dry, so they gradually established a 50-50 profit-sharing deal with countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and other Middle Eastern countries. It was a sweet deal for the Middle East, considering they didn't have any sales channels. Just by owning the oil, they got half the pie without lifting a finger. You bet the local governments were all smiles and handshakes. However, problems began to appear on the horizon. Post-World War II, nearly the whole world had realized the importance of oil extraction. Suddenly, there were over 300 new oil companies, including many state-owned enterprises, all eager for a slice of the action. From the 50s to the 70s, oil production went through the roof, and control over the oil had slowly shifted from the hands of the Seven Sisters to the Middle Eastern governments. This ushered in the formation of OPEC. In the 60s and 70s, the oil scene was heating up, with competition becoming as fierce as a desert storm. Amidst this, the Seven Sisters played their cards close to the chest still managing to buy Middle Eastern oil at much lower prices than they did North American oil. Basically, they were the schoolyard bullies of the oil world. The Middle Eastern countries, tired of being pushed around, realized that they had untapped power. Plus, they had done their homework on cartels. And during the first Arab Petroleum Congress in Egypt in 1959, Saudi Arabia and Venezuela realized it was high time to change the rules of the game. They couldn't let the West continue to manipulate oil prices so, in a strategic move, these oil ministers agreed on what's known as the Mahdi Pact. Their goal? To form a united front to monitor and influence multinational oil company prices. Then, in September 1960, representatives from Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela gathered in Baghdad to discuss how to jointly raise oil prices and shake off the Western grip on their oil. These few countries were among the top five in global oil reserves, holding nearly 60% of the world's known reserves. In a bold move, Saudi Arabia, once a close ally of the United States, stood its ground against American influence. The result? The birth of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. From 1961 to 1975, OPEC grew its ranks from five to 13 members, representing well over half of the world's oil production at the time. So. A new cartel stepped onto the scene to face off against the old one. But what does OPEC do exactly? In a nutshell, OPEC sets oil production levels for its member countries, giving them a handle on the global oil supply, and by extension, power to sway oil prices. 
the power of the US and UK began to wane while the importance of Middle Eastern oil was increasingly on the rise. The previously poor tenants were slowly becoming the new landlords. On October 6, 1973, the Fourth Middle East War, also known as the Yom Kippur War, broke out with Israel fighting against Egypt and Syria. You might ask why suddenly three countries are involved and why it was the fourth war right away. For the topic of this video, the first three are not relevant, but you can learn more about them in our video about Israel's economy. The fourth Middle East war was related to oil. The US, as usual, provided Israel with weapons, equipment, facilities, and technology. Countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq were furious. They had been angry in the previous wars, but it wasn't very effective. However, this time their influence was different. The Arab members of OPEC united to impose an oil embargo on the West. In the 1970s, Europe and America were extremely reliant on oil and were also suffering from high inflation. So this oil embargo was very effective. Within two months, oil prices soared from $15 a barrel to over $60 a barrel. And just for clarity, all these figures have been adjusted for inflation, so we're comparing apples to apples here. This dramatic surge in prices is what went down in history as the first oil crisis. At the same time, the governments of OPEC countries, including Iraq, Kuwait, Venezuela, and finally Saudi Arabia, due to the growing influence of OPEC, eventually nationalized their country's oil one after another. Iran also had a revolution in 1979, overthrowing the government supported by the West and established the Islamic Republic of Iran. After a decade of global turmoil, the Middle East finally ended the era of the Seven Sisters. But hold on! The oil-related drama was far from over. Remember 1979, when Iran overthrew its government? Stepping into the spotlight is Khomeini, a leader with an aggressive position against the West, and ironically armed with weapons originally sold by the US to stand against the Soviet Union. Khomeini's military was formidable. With Iran's significant oil exports in the mix, the US was reluctant to lose influence. To counterbalance Iran, the US, alongside the Soviet Union, instigated Iraq, led by Saddam, to pick a fight with Iran, sweetening the deal with weapons. This sparked the eight-year Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern monarchies, fearing Iran's rise, backed Saddam. As a result, Saudi Arabia and Iran, once two pillars of stability in the Middle East, became adversaries, and conflicts have never ceased since then. Now, picture the impact when two oil titans like Iran and Iraq clash. Their oil production plunges, with sharp consequences for the world given their role as key oil suppliers. Iran's output alone plummeted from 6 million barrels a day to just 1.5 million. Amidst the chaos of war, this sharp decline sends oil prices soaring in the 1980s, jumping from below $70 to over $140 a barrel. This escalation marks the onset of the second oil crisis, adding to a decade already rattled by seismic shifts in the oil industry and the global economy. Inflation in the United States at one point skyrocketed to 13.5%, while the UK and Japan exceeded 20%, numbers not seen since the World War II era. Inflation became the dominant theme of this decade. To manage the oil scarcity, the UK and the US adopted drastic measures. They implemented highway speed limits, reduced airline flights, and even shut down factories. Gas stations were now the new social hubs, with lines of cars stretching for miles. These two oil crises, spanning from 1974 to 1980, triggered global recessions. Yet amidst this chaos, some prospered especially Middle Eastern nations that stayed clear of the war drama, and in particular, Saudi Arabia. The oil crisis were a wake-up call for countries hooked on Middle Eastern oil. Realizing the vulnerability of their economies to OPEC's production decisions, they began to look for ways to reduce this dependence. Alternative energy sources like natural gas, nuclear power, and even reverting to coal became attractive. Billions were invested in researching non-oil energy options. Meanwhile, the global demand for oil actually decreased over those five years due to these efforts. At the same time, countries expanded oil exploration in new regions like the North Sea, Alaska, Mexico, and Canada. And it paid off, leading to a surge in oil production from non-OPEC countries. 
While oil demand was decreasing, the total global supply was increasing. And what happens when supply outpaces demand? Prices fall. By 1982, oil prices were sliding down to a cool 80 US dollars per barrel. Worried about the development, Saudi Arabia called for an urgent OPEC meeting with a plan to cut production and give prices a little nudge upwards. But surprise, surprise, the other OPEC members were pretty cool about the whole $80 per barrel. They figured, hey, money is money, and kept pumping oil. Saudi Arabia then decided to drastically cut their own output to a third of their 1979 levels by 1985 in the hopes to balance the market. And spoiler alert, it didn't work as planned. While Saudi Arabia was holding back, the other members in secret pumped even more, leading to an excess supply. By 1985, this little drama resulted in prices dipping further to $72 per barrel. And now Saudi Arabia, now the big brother in the oil family, really couldn't stand it anymore. Enough is enough, let me teach you a lesson, it thought. They cranked up production and unleashed a tidal wave of cheap oil onto the market. This aggressive strategy halved oil prices to less than $30 per barrel by 1986. Jaws dropped around the world because this meant that for other countries, especially those with high production costs, pumping oil was suddenly about as profitable as selling ice in Antarctica. Let's take a look at the oil production costs of different countries. This is from 2016, showing some typical oil producing countries and their costs of producing crude oil. The highest was the United Kingdom at 44.3 US dollars per barrel. Venezuela, although having the world's largest oil reserves, also had high costs of 27.6 US dollars per barrel. Look at the three little dots on the far right, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Their costs are only about 10 US dollars. You might wonder, with production costs around $10, why would a drop in oil prices from $130 to $30 be a problem? Aren't they still profitable? The key issue is that these countries rely heavily on oil exports, often accounting for over 90% of their total exports, with limited development in other sectors of their economy. They depend on oil revenue, not just to break even, but to cover all their import costs for other necessities. It's like relying on a single income to support a family. You need to earn more than your expenses to sustain a life. Similarly, for these oil-dependent countries, it's not enough for oil prices to merely exceed extraction costs they need high prices enough to balance their national budgets. This necessary price level is known as the fiscal break-even oil price. For instance, Iraq's fiscal break-even oil price is $62 per barrel, while Saudi Arabia's is $86.5. Saudi Arabia needs oil prices at $86.5 per barrel to balance its budget for imports like machinery, food, and consumer goods. Iran's break-even price is even higher around $155 per barrel, and it's risen to nearly $400 in recent times. That's why in 1986, when Saudi Arabia forced the oil price down to $30, it was a move that actually damaged both them and their competitors. It was a bold short-term strategy to enforce discipline among OPEC members. Ultimately, this led to compliance with production limits to stabilize oil prices. Saudi Arabia also managed to maintain its status as the big brother within OPEC. Now let's turn our focus back to Iran and Iraq. They were locked in the long eight-year Iran-Iraq war, a conflict over border issues. It was taxing and costly, but in the end, it amounted to loneliness, as if the war had not happened at all. Iran, without Western economic support, saw its economy collapse. On the other hand, Iraq under Saddam, because of the war, found itself buried under $40 billion in foreign debt. Yet, paradoxically, it had built what was then known as the fourth strongest military power in the world. Burdened with huge debt, but having developed its military muscles, Iraq's next move had a hint of desperation. Saddam looked at Kuwait, small in size but rich in oil, and saw an opportunity to alleviate Iraq's financial burdens. Crucially, Iraq still owed Kuwait $15 billion in foreign debt, a relic from the war. So, on August 2, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. After multiple unsuccessful negotiations between the United States and Iraq, a multinational force launched Operation Desert Storm on January 17, 1991, driving the Iraqi army out of Kuwait with overwhelming force. During the retreat, Saddam didn't forget to set fire to Kuwait's 600 oil wells, which took two months to gradually extinguish. 
This was the famous Gulf War. As a result, sanctions were put on Iraq, which caused the Iraqi economy to never recover. After the oil price was directly brought down by Saudi Arabia in the 80s, it lay flat for 20 years. Now let's fast forward to the year 2000. That's when the price of oil began to soar, even reaching $147 per barrel in 2008, the highest oil price in history. While the Iraq war and OPEC's production cuts played important roles, the key driver was likely China's surging demand following its entry into the WTO in 2001, which fueled its economic boom. Look at this graph showing the oil consumption of different countries. We really don't need to say anything else. The 2008 financial crisis sent prices tumbling from a lofty $147 all the way down to $40. But like a phoenix rising from the ashes, they rebounded to around $80 as the long-term economic fears dissipated. This is the time when America threw a curveball into the global oil game with its shiny new fracking technology. Sure, it couldn't match the $10 a barrel cost of some Middle Eastern oil, but at about $30-something dollars a barrel, it was considered very affordable. By 2013, this innovation had transformed the US from an oil importing country into an oil exporting one. Saudi Arabia leading OPEC tried to suppress oil prices and squeeze out American fracking companies by ramping up production. This caused oil prices to halve from over $100 to $50, creating a global surplus. Despite this, the US didn't hit the brakes. It kept drilling and drilling and drilling. By 2017, it had surpassed Saudi Arabia and Russia taking away the title of the world's leading oil producer. In 2021, global oil production was around 100 million barrels per day, with the US contributing 20%, followed by Saudi Arabia and Russia with just over 10%, and then Canada, China, Iraq, UAE, Brazil, and Iran. Alongside the buzz of fracking, there's been a deeper, more profound shift shaking the oil world since the dawn of the 20th century. People have gradually realized that the excessive consumption of oil would bring significant damage to the environment and the earth because burning oil produces carbon dioxide, leading to global warming. The severity of global warming has already been acknowledged by most countries. And so, in December 2015, over 150 countries signed the Paris Agreement. It's all hands on deck to keep the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This isn't just a local issue anymore. It's a global call for humanity to shift gears to clean energy. Take a look at our current oil consumption. Half of it is fueling our cars. That's why there's this massive push for electric vehicles. The former Saudi oil minister once said, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones and the oil age will end long before we run out of oil. This reflects the dilemma Middle Eastern countries have faced in the past decade. On one hand, with the increasing oil production in the United States, on the other hand, everyone is reducing their dependence on oil. With that, the OPEC's influence weakens. With just 40% of the global oil-making pie, OPEC finds that controlling oil prices is like trying to herd cats. So what does Saudi Arabia do? They reach out to the cool kids outside their club, notably Russia. In November 2016, a significant OPEC meeting led to a production cut agreement, but with a twist. It included 11 non-OPEC countries like Russia. This new larger group was called OPEC Plus, joining the trend of adding a plus to everything, like iPhone Plus, Disney Plus, and now an OPEC Plus. And just like that, there's a new oil cartel on the block. Despite this grand alliance, oil prices didn't rise as significantly as expected. Then came 2020 and with it a pandemic that slammed the brakes on global transportation and manufacturing. Oil demand plummeted. In a bid to steady the ship, Saudi Arabia suggested an even greater cut in production and led by example. But Russia? They decided to zag while everyone else zigged, increasing their production instead. This sparked a brief but intense price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Amidst this and the already lukewarm demand, oil prices took a nosedive to $20 at one point. Eventually, OPEC Plus got back on the same page and agreed again to cut production. From the Seven Sisters to OPEC, you know, OPEC Plus, oil cartels have become increasingly open due to rising competition in the market, leading to a weakened monopoly. Initially, the Seven Sisters had a prearranged share system controlling each member. 
However, OPEC and OPEC Plus members operate independently in production and finances, making mutual monitoring very difficult. This independence means that even if some members don't comply with agreements, there is little legal enforcement, reducing OPEC Plus's impact on oil prices. Saudi Arabia as the big brother sometimes increases production significantly, a risky move to exert influence, but not always effective for long-term cartel stability. In 2022, Western sanctions on Russian oil, coupled with inflation risks in Europe and America, pushed oil prices above $120, giving everyone a flashback to the 1970s oil crisis with a mix of high inflation and oil prices. Central banks in the US, UK and Europe swiftly raised interest rates in response. The IMF, watching from the sidelines, revised its global economic growth forecast from a hopeful 4.4% down to a more, let's be real, 2.9%, all thanks to inflation. The U.S. feeling the heat of inflation basically sent a royal plea to Saudi Arabia. Your Highness, inflation's through the roof. Mind ramping up the oil production to cool things down? Rumor had it that Biden was even considering a personal flying visit to Saudi Arabia to charm the Saudi prince into agreeing. Yet, Saudi Arabia resists being influenced by Western demands. Cautious not to upset Russia, their new buddy, showcasing the complexities of current global oil politics. Anyway, that's roughly the situation now. I've done my best to sort out this century-long mess. If you like the content, please leave a like. In May last year, with the surge in oil prices and the crash of the US stock market, Saudi Aramco surpassed Apple to become the world's highest valued company. And while the world's pushing hard on the energy transition pedal, it doesn't mean the Middle Eastern princes are heading for early retirement. The modern economy's dependence on oil is still very high. Many institutions predict that oil consumption will peak around 2035 to 2040 and then will gradually decline. So, for a good while yet, oil will still be the focus of the world, and the Middle East will continue to play a pivotal role. The 100-year battle for oil is far from over.